Wow, what an awesome privilege it is to be back home. And I really do consider Viola University to be home. I love this school so much. It got me in trouble with about 2,400 students in Wheaton, Illinois, just a couple weeks ago. I stood up in chapel where they had paid money to fly me out there, and I greeted them as the second best university in the country, right behind Biola. So. <laughs> I don't think I'll get invited back, but hey, I had one shot at the mic and I said, that's what I'm going to do. So what an honor to be here with you. I am just so excited. Um, I'll talk some more about this in our afternoon session, but uh, God continues to do great stuff through our church in Memphis, Tennessee, and we asked the Lord to send us to the most difficult urban center in the country that was racially divided along black-white lines, and as of the 2000 census, that was... Memphis, Tennessee, and uh, a lot of people told us that we could not plant a gospel-driven, disciple-making, multi-ethnic, Revelation 5, 9, and 10 community there, and uh, God, we just believed him, and uh, eight years later, we're about 65% white, 35% black, 1,500 people about to launch our third location, and we are just really excited about what God is doing out there. Uh, we, we, uh, I brought with me uh, one of the young men in our residency program. We are really passionate about uh, preparing and launching out the next generation of, of leaders, and so we send them to seminary, pay for 100% of it, and um, we're going to actually start a scholarship here at the school as well, been talking to Dr. Corey, and uh, we're, we're training up these young men, and so I want you to welcome Derek Puckett with me uh, this morning. Why don't you stand up, Derek? Yeah. He and his wife Kaylee and sweet daughter Ramiah just moved down from Indianapolis and they're living in Memphis, Tennessee, and we are glad to have them. If you have your Bibles, please meet me in Matthew chapter 9. I could talk forever. I'm a black preacher and uh, I could just uh, give introductory marks forever. Uh, shout out to Dr. Corey and the chairman Stan and his wife. I'm just so excited to be here, but you didn't ask me to come to tell you how excited I am to be here. There's a a word that God has on my heart as we prepare to launch this conference today, and uh, happy to be with my friend Glenn. Um, but racial reconciliation, caring for other people, doesn't happen unless we have this one fundamental Christ-honoring trait, and it's this thing called compassion. Pick me up in verse 35 of Matthew chapter 9, and hear now the word of the Lord from this all-familiar passage. And Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. When he saw the crowds, verse 36, here it is, he had compassion for them. Why? Because they were harassed, helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the, the harvest is plentiful but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord, the harvest, to send out laborers into his harvest. If you lived in Cartagena in the 17th century, uh, no doubt you became well acquainted with and knew a lot about a Jesus lover named Pedro Claver. Pedro Claver was neither black nor was he a slave, but Pedro Claver, this gospel-driven Jesus lover, described himself this way, Pedro Claver, friend and servant of black slaves. When the slaves would first come into Cartagena there in the early 17th century, the first person they would see would be Pedro. Pedro would be standing there with baskets of food because he knew that most of these slaves on these slave ships were malnourished. They didn't have the kind of food that they needed, and so he would greet them with food. He would also be standing there with baskets of clothing, waiting to clothe these underdressed slaves, and he would also stand there waiting with a team of doctors to attend to their physical bodies, knowing that many of them would be sick. In fact, some of them would become leprous, and he was so concerned over this that he would, out of his own pocket, help to build a leprosarium to care for these leprous black slaves. 
Ah, but to know Pedro is to know a man who did not just care for the physical needs of people. No, Pedro knew that they had a much greater need, a spiritual need. And so one of the first things Pedro would do is he would gather the slaves together and would bring an interpreter and would sit down with these slaves and proclaim to them the gospel of the kingdom of God. He would share the good news of Jesus Christ, citing such scriptures as Romans 5, 8, that God has demonstrated his love towards you in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for you. Oh, if I can just pause and say that's one of my favorite verses in all of the Bible that God demonstrated his love for us. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Well, one of my favorite words in Romans 5, 8 isn't so much God or demonstrated or loved, but one of my favorite words there is while. While. That God didn't wait for Brian Loritz to to cure his problems before he sent Christ to die for me. That God didn't wait for us to get over the addictions or the porn problem or or, or, or the drugs or the alcohol or the, the lying problem. But God saw us in the midst of our mess and he purchased us as is. All of our faults, flaws, failures. This is what Pedro would proclaim to them, and several of them would come to know Jesus, and then Pedro was concerned about discipling them and nurturing them, and the unheard of that a non-black freed person would disciple slaves in 17th century Cartagena. And so he would teach them the complex doctrines Yet essential doctrines of the faith, it is said that Pedro Claver would take a piece of cloth, would fold it so that there would be three corners, and he would illustrate the Trinity to him. See, the three corners represent Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but it's one cloth. And thus, he would minister to the bodies and the souls of these slaves, and he would do that until he died. If you were to ask Pedro, Pedro, why do you spend so much time caring for these people? I know you're busy and the amount of ministry demands on your life. Why do you go to such extremes? Pedro would answer, I care for these people. I I have compassion for them. But I I, I feel compelled under the Holy Spirit to say this to you. I I went to school here, and I I thank God for it. Everything that I become in this life is ultimately because of the sovereignty of God, but the sovereignty of God through the investment of this school in my life. But I want to tell you, this school prepares us to be people who will go out and receive a paycheck, many of us, to bring the kingdom here on earth. And here's the danger. The danger is we can become professionals. The danger is we can can preach for a paycheck. The danger is we can disciple and evangelize and plant churches just to put food on the table. And I know far too many professional Christians who have no compassion. And I beg you, in the words of John Piper, brothers, sisters, we are not professionals. And it's a scary thing to do the work of the ministry devoid and detached from any compassion. As we come to our text this morning, we're going to see a busy Jesus. In fact, if you read the Gospel of Matthew, one of the major sections in Matthew is Matthew chapters 8 and 9. And I want to implore you, just just read it in one sitting. Matthew chapters 8 and 9, we see Jesus moving at a frenetic, breakneck pace. It's a succession of 10 miracles, and I wish I could really walk you through it. And most of these miracles, hear it now, are interruptions. Most of what happens in Matthew chapters 8 and 9 doesn't show up on the iCal app of Jesus. It's not scheduled. He gets finished preaching. He's coming down from the mountain preaching the greatest sermon ever preached, a sermon on the mountain. He's probably tired in his humanity. Up pops a leper. He deals with the leper, and moments later, up pops a centurion. A little while later, he's so tired, he just wants to get some sleep. He's sleeping in a boat, and boom, up pops a storm, and he's got to deal with that. A little while later, he's teaching, and in the middle of teaching, the roof opens up, and a paralytic drops in on him, literally, and he's got to deal with that. 
I mean, it's one interruption after another. And yet here's what blows my mind about Jesus. I'm at your neighborhood. You read the gospel of Jesus Christ. Most of his most impactful ministry moments were those that were not scheduled. And I got to say this to we Americans who worship the idol of busyness who love to talk about how jam-packed our schedules are. How many ministry moments have we missed just this week? Because we're overscheduled. You're driving down the street. The Spirit is on you about pulling over and ministering to that person, but you're, you're overscheduled. We see a Jesus who wasn't too busy to deal with the lepers, the centurions, the storms, the demoniacs, the paralytics of life. And because Jesus had margin in his calendar, he was able to change the trajectory of so many souls. I want to beg you, do not revel in busyness. Leave margin in your schedules. So when we come to Matthew chapter 9, and boy, I've got to fly. We see a Jesus who's extremely busy. Look at verse 35. Matthew says that Jesus went throughout all the cities, all the villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every disease and every affliction. Stop right there. Scholars are, are it's interesting to see them go back and forth. They're saying, is he really doing all of this? Is he really going to all the cities, all the villages, healing every disease, every affliction? And they go back and forth. But I should say that's to miss the point. Matthew wants us to see that, that Jesus is totally extending himself, totally doing all that he can. He is incredibly busy. And yet in the middle of his busyness, as he's preaching and teaching... Here's a guy who's totally spent, and I get it. Just this month alone, I've, I've preached over 40 times this month, and it's been a crazy month. And if I'm Jesus, I'm going, that's it. I'm tired. I'm done. But when he gets finished preaching, he doesn't slip out the side door. He stands and heals people, lays his hands on them. Jesus, why do you do this? Verse 36 when he saw the crowds, he had underline it, make a mental note of it, type it in your phone, compassion. What is compassion? Anytime we talk about biblical compassion, there's always three components. Number one, the primary component for compassion is compassion assumes need. There is no such thing as compassion un unless there is this need. Here the need. Why did Jesus have compassion? Where's the need? Verse 36, they were harassed. The Greek word for har harassed, it means to be beaten down. It, it means to be troubled. It means to be burdened. Jesus looks out there and he doesn't just see one mass of humanity. This isn't about another gig or building a platform to, 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 to build some mega church. He says, guys, look at them. They're harassed. They're, they're beaten down. But secondly, compassion doesn't just assume need. There is an emotive compassion. Uh, component to compassion. The Greek word for compassion, it means to feel moved by. In the Latin, the idea of compassion literally means to suffer with. You hear those emotive terms? Here's my concern for myself, for you, for us, living in a 21st century world. Every day, we're inundated with image after image and story after story about incredible need. I mean, I mean you, you, you surf the web or you turn on the radio or you watch TV and you, you hear or read about the abduction up in New England or the sex trafficking that's happening out in, in, in Asia or, or, or the race riot that's going on somewhere and it's need after need. And if we're not careful, our souls can become anesthetized. Some of us aren't even moved by it. I mean, when was the last time you wept over the kidnap? When was the last time you cried 
over the abduction? When was the last time you, you shed tears over that Christian who was martyred? Whenever we talk about compassion, there's an emotional component, but you still don't have compassion. Just because you have need, just because you feel bad, that's not compassion. My wife cries at Hallmark commercials. <laughs> you don't have compassion yet. Compassion is only actualized in this third compo component. There's need. I see it. I feel it. Thirdly and finally, I do something about it. I do something. He's got compassion on the crowd. What does he do? He, he heals them. He has compassion on their souls. What does he do? He preaches the gospel of the kingdom to them. Compassion is seeing, feeling, doing. Are you compassionate? Are you compassionate? If you were to come to Memphis, Tennessee right now, or you were to read the commercial appeal, you would know that our city is in a very tenuous place right now. There is what is called the consolidation issue that is confronting Memphis. What the consolidation issue boils down to is on the table is a, an order to bring about the merger of Memphis City Schools, which primarily comprise the urban African-American poor with the county schools. This is an uproar because many of our middle to upper middle class people move to the county schools because they're so much better. Now what you are having in Memphis, Tennessee is the collision and merger of issues of education, economics, and race. It's a linchpin issue in our town. I'm so proud of my colleague, Dr. Maxie Dunham, who pastors a United Methodist Church, not the liberal kind, but a part of the confessing church movement. He got up in front of his several thousand member upper, upper middle class white church and he said these words. Just the other Sunday, Dr. Maxie Dunham said, the, edu the educational gap in our city is astounding. Let us not be naive to think issues of economics and race aren't tied into it. If justice prevailed, all of our schools would have the resources to be equally effective. The inequality in public education is blatant, he says, and I believe sinful. This is what he says. Middle class church that has started a middle class, upper middle class private school, he says this, it is our statement that if our church is going to provide quality education for our, for our suburban constituency through Christ Methodist Day School, justice requires that we must seek the same for children in impoverished communities like Binghampton and Orange Mound and the whole city of Memphis. And so they're starting a school in which 80% of the people who come there cannot afford to go there. That's compassion. See it? Feel it. Do it. Are you compassionate, friends? When was the last time you saw need, you felt the need, and you did something about the need? I'm concerned for my kids. Being a parent in the 21st century in the Disneyland of the world, the United States of America. If I do nothing, I will unleash from my house narcissistic, materialistic, spoiled brats who assume that the world is about them. So when my boys turn 10, like my oldest boy is about to, we do something called manhood training. Now, he's very excited about this. He doesn't realize that a part of manhood training means 
Now that he can see past the handlebars on the lawnmower, he's cutting grass. <laughs> but this summer, I'm getting him a job, which I think is illegal. I didn't ask any questions. <laughs> and I'm taking him with me to Honduras. I want my kid to see other kids rummaging through garbage cans for lunch. So we go down to Target House in Memphis. There at Target House are the parents of kids who've got cancer who come from all across the country to go to St. Jude's and my kids have played Nerf basketball with the likes of young Nolan who just died not too long ago from leukemia. I want them to see need. I want them to realize that life is not about Madden 2011. And I want them to be moved by this need. My kids are getting it. I was with my oldest son the other day and we're walking down the street. We're going to a Grizzlies game. I should say we're going to a funeral. And so here we are walking down the street. And there's a homeless guy. I'm, I'm walking, I've talked to him, and my son stayed back, my nine-year-old, and he reaches in his pocket and gives him all of his money. I'm going, yes, now don't deify him, because moments later he punched his other brother in the mouth. <laughs> but I'm saying, yes, son, you get it. The nine-year-old saw it. A nine-year-old felt it, and a nine-year-old did something about it. Viola, study, study hard, but never be a professional. The difference between professional and kingdom workers who walk in the footsteps of Jesus is one word, compassion. Compassion. We hope you enjoyed this message. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Learn more at biola.edu.